Hey YouTube and hi engineering. I'm Sean and this is James I have with me today and this is the second support videos in a series of videos we're doing for Edge 1200. This week you voted for you wanted a mid-semester review of what you wanted to study for the upcoming exam. So James here will be covering the material section and I'll be covering the problem solving session. Now just as a general disclaimer neither of us has seen the mid-semester exam so we can't guarantee everything we go through is everything you need to know. It's your responsibility to make sure you cover all the materials that you need to know for the exam. But the stuff we give you would be a good up place to start and some general things that would be really good for you to understand going into that mid-semester exam. So if you have any questions about it or you want to uh, follow up on anything, make sure you jump on Casper Q&A and ask us there. I don't know if I look weird just staring at it, but... <laughs> So why does heat treating a metal change its strength, elongation to break, and toughness, but not its Young's modulus? Well, what it all comes back to is what physical mechanisms are responsible for each property. Modulus is calculated from the elastic part of the curve before yielding, where the material deforms only from stretching the atomic bonds. Tensile strength, toughness, and elongation to break are all calculated from the plastic part of the tensile curve after yielding. In this region, it is the movement of dislocations that governs deformation. So when you heat treat a metal, you can produce a variety of microstructures with different grain sizes or introduced second phase particles. So different microstructures change how hard it is for dislocations to move through the metal. Therefore, heat treatment can change the tensile strength, elongation to break, and toughness. But heat treating the metal doesn't change the composition of the metal. It still has the same amount of atoms. Therefore, the atomic bonds in the metal won't change very much, and so the modulus doesn't change. So why do we plot the tensile curve using stress and strain and not force and extension. If we were to plot force versus extension for two samples that were different shapes but the same material, we would get two different curves, as the amount of force and extension a sample can take is dependent on its shape. By converting load to stress, we are removing the dependence on the sample's cross-section. By converting extension to strain, we are removing its dependence on the sample's gauge length. As a result, the stress versus strain curve generated for the two tested samples will be the same. In this way, the material properties calculated from stress versus strain curves are the same for any component made out of the same material, regardless of its shape. And this allows us to understand the properties of something large, like an I-beam, just by testing small tensile samples. So just to reiterate the point, if we were to have two tensile samples made out of the same material, but one had a cross-section, cross-sectional area twice as large as the other, we would find it could take twice the force as the other. But if we converted force to stress, we would find that both samples could take the same maximum stress. Therefore, they would have the same ultimate tensile strength. Why after necking does the tensile curve in a ductile metal go down while the tensile curve for a ductile polymer it can go up? After a neck forms in a ductile metal, the region now has a smaller cross section and as a result the neck can't take as much load. As the neck is now the weakest part of the sample, further deformation continues at the neck and so its cross section continues to reduce and so the load it can take reduces. During necking in a ductile polymer, the polymer chains within that region to begin to unravel and align in the direction of the applied load. Chains also move closer together, therefore the van der Waals forces between the chains increase. As a result, the neck region becomes more resistant to further deformation, and further alignment of the polymer chains then continues to occur 
only in the ends of the net region, extending along the length of the sample in a process called cold drawing. Only once the entire sample is encompassed by the net does the sample begin to resist further extension and we have an increase in load. Why do different polymers have different glass transition temperatures? Well, the glass transition temperature in a polymer is when below such temperature all long range chain motion ceases. So if a polymer has a lower glass transition temperature than another, this means it's easier for chain movement to occur. So there are a few mechanisms that can resist chain movement. First, the amount of space between the polymer chains. So the closer the chains are together, the stronger the van der Waals forces. How close polymer chains can get is also dependent on how well they can pack. This is affected by bulky side groups on the chain, as well as how ordered the polymer chains are. In a crystalline polymer, the chains are packed very close, and so the van der Waals forces are very strong. Another mechanism that can resist chain movement is mechanical restraint. And this can be provided by having large side groups on your chain or having polymer chains that are very long, increasing entanglement. Since different polymers have different repeat units and different chain lengths, as well as can be crystalline or amorphous, they therefore can have different glass transition temperatures. So the first topic is flow charting. What we expect you to know is to be able to read a flowchart and understand what the flowchart is doing or the program is trying to achieve. We also expect you to understand the different engineering conventions used of the four major basic symbols that you will encounter. So the first one is the start and the stop block, which always comes at the start and the end of every flowchart you draw. These are rectangular and they have rounded edges. Next, you have your input block, which is when you take data into your system. So that could be something like reading a temperature sensor. After that, you've got your decision blocks, which are diamond shapes. They contain some sort of decision to be made, could be mathematical, could be word-based. They always take one input and give you two outputs. The outputs need to be labelled as either yes, true, or no, false. The last one is a process or action box. This is when you're doing something, and these are rectangular blocks that you will use. So, for example, I've got my actions as dance and sleep as my actions. Aside from being able to read a flowchart, we also expect you to be able to generate a flowchart from scratch given a text-based problem. Now, as there is no past exam paper for this course, I'm going to assist you and I will provide you with a practice question for each of the sections that I'll go through in this video. The practice question can be found on Casper Q&A and you can have a go there, post your result and then you'll get a response and see how you went. So I'm going to read the question out now but you can see it typed out on Casper Q&A. I want you to draw a flowchart for a program which records if I flip a coin, a fair coin, twice it records the result, and then if I get the same result twice in a row, it will give me a prize. So, have a go at that, draw a flowchart, take a screenshot, post it on Casper, and you can compare your answer to what other students got, and we'll see which one is the correct answer. Solvent. For this section, you're expected to know what each of the letters in solvent stand for, and what falls under each category. So in my example here, I've got a square, and I'm trying to find the length of one side of my square. So for my S sketch, I've drawn my square, and I've labelled everything I know about that square on my diagram. In my O section, you have to make sure you complete both components, which is objectives and observations. So my objective would be to find the length of one side, and my observations, there could be many, in this case I only have one, is my square has four sides. Across to my L and B, which is the list of variables and constants, we're looking for you to do four components. We want to see that you write out the variable or the constant, 
Then give us the symbol that represents it. Tell us the value of its known. And finally, give us the units of that variable or constant. In your E, which is your equations, write out the equations you think are important to your question or that you're given. The constants or variables found in your equations should be able to be found in your L and V section. And finally, in manipulation, you need to rearrange your equation to identify the thing you're trying to solve for or the one thing that the question is asking you for. In this case, I want to find the length of one side, so I've rearranged for L, giving me P over 4. If you want to know more about this entire process, the solving process, you can check out my previous video, which is all about solving for more detail. Now, just like before, I'm going to give you a practice question you can try, and it's going to be on Casper Q&A again. Post your answer there, and you can see how you went. So I'm going to read out the question now, but find it online. So, I'm a new cloth company and I want to wrap some polystyrene blocks in my new material. I have spheres of 10 centimeters in diameter and cubes with 5 centimeter sides. Now my client has 20 spheres and 12 cubes and I want to know how much material is it going to take me to wrap all these objects up. So I want you to use the solving approach and give me a solution for that question. Normal distributions. For this section, we want to see if you understand the difference between mean, median, and mode. What do they mean, and where do they come from? Could you calculate them? How do these three properties affect the normal distribution? What about variance and range? Can you describe to us what they do, what they mean, and how they also affect the normal distribution? Could you draw this curve? and the effects that these have when they're changed on this curve. And lastly, can you tell us whereabouts in the real world would you find a normal distribution and why would they be used? So, my practice question for you guys on Casper Q&A will be this. Draw a normal distribution curve. Then, on the same axis, in a different colour, I want you to draw a second line which incorporates an increase in mean and a decrease in variance. On this, does the, because of this new line, does the mode change or does it have the same mode as the original line? Can you draw the mode on each of these two graphs? Excel. So for Excel, we're looking for you to demonstrate some knowledge on basic Excel formulas such as min, max and average. There may be a few other ones that are commonly used as well. We then want you to show us that you know how to use conditional formatting found at the top of the toolbar. You can use this to find largest values, smallest values, or even values that fall under a certain condition. Next is doing calculations and filling in data. So you may need to use the equal sign to start a calculation, refer to different cells within the spreadsheet to calculate the total value. You might need to fill in lots of data quickly by clicking and dragging and within this perhaps you want to lock a cell that you're referring to by using the dollar sign. Lastly, could you generate graphs given some data that you have, whether this be bar graphs, column graphs or even just a scatter plot. So the practice question I'm going to give you now for Casper is this. Given that you have two columns of data, could you Describe two different ways in which you can find the largest value in each column really quickly. Each column has roughly 100 rows, so you can't manually scroll through it. Now also, can you give me two different ways to find the standard deviation in each column using two different formulas? Mathematical models. In a mathematical model, could you distinguish between the differences between an exponential, a power, a logarithmic, and any other mathematical model on a graph? Perhaps if we gave you an equation, for example. What are some of the defining characteristics of that type of mathematical model? Could you give us some real-life examples of perhaps where you might find some of these? For example, you might find exponential growth 
in bacteria colonies. Now, given a data point, or given some information about an equation, would you be able to solve the equation given to find a different variable on a graph and also in an equation? So, with that in mind, I'm going to give you another practice question. This time, I've given you the equation right here. It will also be on Casper Q&A, so please post what you think there. You've got a scientist looking at colonies of bacteria. Number of colonies of bacteria is n over a period of days d. A and c are coefficients. So given this equation, the scientist wants to know what happens to the shape of his graph if he changes the variables a or, or the variable c. Can you describe what happens to the shape of that graph? Data manipulation. Given some data points, like the blue x's on this graph, we expect you to be able to sort through this data and produce some results for analysis. So starting with this sort of data here, you may need to clean up the data, maybe remove outliers or look at the values of it to make sure you have good data before you proceed. After that, you might want to consider generating a trend line to show the general behaviour of these data points. Now to do that, you would consider the context of the problem because that will give you some insight into which trend lines might be appropriate for your data set. In addition, on your problem solving workbook, there was a flowchart that showed you a series of steps that you can take to try and find what sort of trend line that your data would follow. Through Excel, you can generate a trend line, like the red line I've got here, and it will give you an R squared value. So you have to remember that R squared values, which are closest to one, tell you that this line is the closest fit to the data that you have. But be careful though, because even though it might have a high R squared value, from the context of the question, you might know that that mathematical model is wrong because it doesn't fit how the data should behave. Now, what else about graphs? Let's have a look. If we gave you two data points on the graph, and we said to assume linearity and told you to find this red x in the middle, would you be able to use the interpolation equation taught to you in problem solving to get the value for this data point in the middle? Okay, so for the Casper question for this part, I'm going to tell you you have two arbitrary sets of data, x and y, two columns. Now, what would you do to plot these data on a set of axes? What would you do to the axes to show that this data follows a logarithmic model? For the MATLAB section, we're looking at if you understand basic syntax of coding languages. As an example, we've got two ampersands here, which stands for AND. The double vertical lines means OR. You've got semicolons, which is used at the end of lines of code, and you've got double equal signs, which is used to care comparing variables to things. Do you understand the decision-making process used in code codes? So this is the if a certain condition is true, then execute a certain command, otherwise or else do something else. Now this is very similar to the things that you were doing in flowcharts where you had the diamond decision-making box. Now using this knowledge, could you read some code, figure out what's going on, and perhaps figure out where the error is and fix that error so it works again? The question for you on Casper this week will be to write one line of code that would tell me if the value of x is greater than 6 and is not equal to 9. Okay, so that concludes the end of the mid-semester support video. If you like the videos and you want more continue, feel free to like and subscribe to the videos. And don't forget to jump on Casper so we can get some answers from different students and see how you guys are going with your mid-semester preparation. Good luck for your exams.